Well, it's nice to be back again. And it, it was actually great just looking at those slides on the 150 years uh, to try and put in perspective the, the, the short time uh, that we've had with the genome revolution. Uh, so our first draft of the human genome was uh, announced at the White House uh, uh, 10 years ago this last June. It'll be uh, next February uh, when we announce, when we have the 10-year anniversary of that. And we have a huge conference here in San Diego to uh, celebrate that. So all the wonderful things that you heard from uh, uh, from George, from Anne, from others, uh, have all transpired uh, in this last decade. But I, I think they made me the last speaker to put some of this stuff in context, because uh, it was only five years ago where we had the first complete genome. Uh, now, not only is it a fad to do it, uh, it was very cool today to see a 1,000 genomes published, uh, not much phenotype with them. Uh, but what we need is 10 million genomes uh, with the corresponding information are all we'll have is these nice anecdotes uh, that you heard. We have a, a very long way to go. Uh, as Juan said, we are all one species, but we're not all that similar. Uh, if we're defining microbial species, some of us might be defined a separate species. Uh, we're actually one to three percent difference when we look at all the differences in the genome, all the structural rearrangements, insertion, deletions, what most people count are just the single base pair changes, but they account for less than half of all the variants in the species. For example, in my genome, we found uh, over 40% of my proteins that are produced uh, are unique, and that's going to be true uh, for all of you. Uh, it's actually more amazing that medicine works given that degree of variation than that some things only work on a third of the population. Uh, we have a very long way to go in genomics to get genomics to the place where there's the cool kind of tools that Eric Topol showed us that are changing how uh, uh, to see and track the human body and it's our conditions. We're at this very, very early stage. In fact, even understanding our differences is what this early sets of data will help. We found uh, a Hun Chinese was sequenced and from uh, uh, Vanessa Hayes at uh, my institute uh, looking at Bushmen in Africa, and then comparing uh, across these, uh, we are all quite similar. But as we know that life did evolve out of Africa, and we look at three different populations that Vanessa looked at, the variation in Africa itself is far greater than between Africans and the rest of the world. So there's more variation uh, there. And it's important to try and understand these differences with HIV all the differences uh, that are showing up in the diseases. Uh, you heard yesterday about the microbiome. Juan mentioned it again. Uh, this came out of just applying the same tools we had for sequencing the genome to see what was in the gut. And it was actually uh, uh, quite stunning. Uh, most humans are born without any microbes, and we acquire those uh, pretty quickly uh, during life. And some of these have some uh, very uh, pronounced effect on our lives. Uh, it's pretty stunning, I think, still for people to learn that uh, you have a thousand unique species in your mouth. Uh, you probably worry about it if the person next to you is coughing. Um, but all these genes that we have from our microbes add up to, uh, as others said, substantially higher than our 20,000 some odd genes. And we can't understand human biology without understanding what all our associated organisms do. Uh, for example, uh, looking at different diseases, we have to look at the comparison of our human genetic code, uh, the set of microbes with us, uh, our immune system, and the environment. Uh, this can lead to some strange conclusions. Uh, many people think that uh, liver damage uh, from alcohol is due to the alcohol effects on the liver. It's actually due to a bacteria that releases a toxin. Uh, so I've come up with a new thing that probably the physicians in the audience won't like, but m my theory is if you take antibiotics with alcohol, you should be better off uh, <laughs> and, 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 instead of refusing to take them. Uh, and you can drink all you want and not get liver damage. So uh, science is really wonderful. Um, <laughs> but also we can maybe understand different causes of disease. So I, I'm sure you have seen and will see other things like this. The, change in different cancer rates uh, from 1975. And one really stands out, and that's esophageal cancer. And when we look in th at these patients and look at their uh, microbiome, um, 
they have two different sets of microbes. So we don't know if these are causal, uh, do they lead to the cause of cancer, or do they populate uh, differently? But it gives a way to perhaps get early diagnosis uh, and even possible eventual treatment, as Juan suggested, by uh, changing uh, your microbes versus changing uh, your genes. So what do these microbes provide um, that our own genetic code uh, don't? And all we can do is uh, give you some broad hints right now. So if we look at our 20,000 some odd genes and how many different proteins there might be, uh, we have around 2,400 different chemicals that our bodies can make on their own, just using our genes and proteins. But if we were to take a sample of your blood uh, in any of you after just having lunch, uh, we'll find about 500 different chemicals circulating. Uh, this is California, you might find a few more. Uh, but only 60% of them uh, are from our own metabolism. 30% uh, are from all the things you just had for lunch. Uh, but 10% are on the order of 50 chemicals circulating uh, through your brain right now are from bacterial metabolites. So they're taking the food you eat and they're making unique chemicals. We have no idea the effect these have on how our brains uh, function, how we feel, what diseases they cause, what diseases they might prevent. So we need a broader picture as we look at it. And if we look at what uh, people die from today and what they might die from in, in the future, uh, right now, communicable diseases uh, are uh, about a little under 30%. That includes uh, maternal, uh, but all the infectious diseases. And we look at heart disease and cancer, it's 63%. And over time, as we project because of new applications that I'll talk about, for example, the vaccines are projected to help alleviate infectious disease, the increase that we'll see in cancer and heart disease uh, obviously becomes a much larger percentage. When we look at things like HIV now, there's well over 33 million people on the planet living with this disease. Uh, obviously, we need to get a, a vaccine and looking at uh, vaccines and why they failed, uh, it's because the genetic code of the virus changes very rapidly. Uh, and there's lots of different versions of it in different places, and they respond differently. So just like we don't have a vaccine against the common cold, against malaria, against diseases with genetic codes that evolve very rapidly, uh, they've not been effective. But we have some new tools now. Uh, and the new tools are evolving out of what we've done in the last 15 years uh, with synthetic life. So this is what we announced uh, this last spring. Uh, Richard asked me to really go slowly through this and dumb it down because he didn't understand it the first time Thank through. And so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, 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 to help <laughs> you do this. So uh, what we developed was the first cell with a completely synthetic genome. Uh, and I'll walk you through uh, how we got there. So in 2003, uh, we started uh, uh, writing the genetic code. When we'd read your genomes, when uh, George or any of the other groups, uh, the paper in Nature Day, read your genetic code, it's digitizing biology. So it's the first phase of interfacing us with the digital world. Uh, my genetic code, some of yours, is in these ones and zeros in the computer. And our whole goal with synthetic genomics was to go in the other direction, to start with the ones and zeros, starting with four bottles of chemicals, writing new genetic code, uh, and going the other way to see if we could boot up uh, that genetic code. So in 2003, uh, these techniques didn't work very well in writing the genetic code. There's lots of errors, and we had to develop some new techniques for even getting 5,000 letters of genetic code accurately written. And that was for this small uh, virus uh, that affects uh, E. coli. The fun stage was after we started in the computer and these four bottles of chemicals had this new piece of synthetic DNA, we injected it into E. coli. E. coli started reading the synthetic piece of DNA and started making viral proteins. They self-assembled and made the viral particle. Uh, the, var the particle was not very uh, uh, gracious. It turned around and killed the cells that made it. And that's how we detect it. These clear plaques on the plate is where the virus killed uh, the bacteria so we can easily detect it. 
So we call this a situation where the software now is building its own hardware. All we did was put in a piece of synthetic chemical and it ended up with a virus. But we wanted to do this on a much larger scale and we learned how to write large pieces of DNA, but we had to learn how to transplant that DNA into the species uh, to get something new. So this was one of the most important studies we've, uh, I think, ever done, where simply by changing the DNA in a cell, we converted one species into another. We are information systems. We're biological information systems. We're machines driven by that information. You change that information in the cell, you change the whole characteristics and what that species is. So we took one genome from one cell, put it in another, uh, and that cell converted into the whole new species. In 2008, we scaled up the synthesis of DNA. We developed new techniques allowing us to get to larger and larger pieces, so that at the end of uh, 2008, we were able to report the synthesis now of a 500,000 uh, 500, uh, uh, base pair uh, genome from a small bacterial cell. Uh, but we weren't able to boot it up. There were a lot of complications with getting that DNA in a cell uh, in an active form. So going ahead to 2009, we solved some of these problems, and Dan Gibson at the Institute developed new ways now, instead of years and years to make small pieces of DNA, he developed this one pot reaction. We just throw in three enzymes, some chemicals, heat it to 50 degrees centigrade, uh, and we can uh, make uh, anything, which allows this now to be done robotically to try and scale up making uh, synthetic uh, genomes. We tested this, and this has been uh, recently published, where we synthesized, uh, using this technique uh, robotically, uh, the entire mouse mitochondrial genome, which actually envisions now being able to potentially transplant uh, and use a mitochondrial therapy. There's a lot of diseases caused by defects in the mitochondria and mitochondrial genome. Maybe we can just add uh, new DNA uh, and get new cells. We also found that biology is a little bit tricky and the DNA had to be methylated to be transplanted, which is why the early experiments didn't work, and it had to be extremely accurate. So with this system, we can go completely around a circle, taking the DNA from a cell, moving it from bacteria into a eukaryote. We can then make lots of changes in that DNA, uh, transplant it back into another cell, and convert that cell into a new cell. Uh, but that still wasn't doing it with synthetic DNA. So that takes us ahead uh, to uh, this year, uh, where we've had all the key advances that led us to our publication this spring of the creation of a bacterial cell now completely controlled by a synthetic uh, chromosome. And so we made a much larger piece now. This genome is over one million letters. So starting with four bottles of chemicals, we made this piece of DNA assembled it in yeast, transplanted it out of yeast into a recipient bacterial cell, and that cell converted into what was coded on this synthetic DNA. We call it a synthetic cell because everything in the cell was made driven by this synthetic piece of DNA. Uh, it didn't exist uh, uh, before. So this is the route that we followed to make this a large piece of DNA, just starting with DNA synthesizers and these four bottles of chemicals and going through these semi-automated uh, reactions to get to the entire chromosome. We thought when we did this, it would be very simple now just to boot this up and get the genome, but it set us back three more months because we had one letter wrong uh, out of the million letters of genetic code. So all these changes that you've heard various people talk about that can cause disease, these different traits, uh, there's parts of our genome where if the spelling is wrong, you either have major defects or you don't have life. So we had one letter wrong and it took us three months to find uh, of that letter because the sequencing techniques weren't sensitive enough to find that level of accuracy. We corrected that and we got this uh, cell. So this is the map of the entire uh, uh, genome, uh, those bars being the different genes in the cell. This is the picture of the uh, first uh, synthetic cells. Uh, it was closely related uh, to uh, a cell because uh, obviously we're starting by studying life, uh, but the next steps now that we know this is working is we can uh, make new combinations to come up with uh, new life forms. 
It's not totally uh, similar uh, to other species, and it's the first genome to have its own website uh, built into its genetic code. And hundreds of scientists now have solved this and sent it to uh, the web address that's built into the genetic code. So there's, there's a code within the code within the code. So these are unique pieces that we inserted in the DNA. Uh, the first uh, lines in blue tell us, tell you how to read uh, from the DNA code uh, the English language. Uh, and the rest shows the 46 names that are uh, uh, the scientists that wrote uh, this uh, entire uh, genome. And we also put in some quotes from uh, uh, James Joyce, uh, Richard Feynman, and uh, something from Oppenheimer's uh, book. So it's not your uh, normal species, uh, but you can get to the web address by uh, solving this code, as I said, a large number of people have done. This is not just frivolous, it's important, we think, to separate uh, synthetic species uh, from naturally occurring ones, because the biology is going to get confusing enough, uh, especially if one is uh, correct. Uh, what are we using this for? I mean, we're using it for a very large number of things. Uh, it, it's a technique that applies to all areas of life. Uh, some of you have heard about our program with ExxonMobil trying to make new algae uh, to create fuel from uh, sunlight and CO2. Uh, but our recent announcement is what we're doing in the vaccine area. And we've been working with Novartis for a long time, and they just had come out of phase three clinical trials, the new meningitis vaccine uh, that should be available uh, quite soon. And you can see some of the other vaccines that uh, uh, we're working with them. But uh, flu vaccine has been a real uh, challenge. Uh, you saw that it took over six months to get the H1N1 vaccine out. Uh, uh, and fortunately, it wasn't as uh, uh, problematic as everybody uh, thought it might have been. Uh, so we've formed this uh, new enterprise uh, to have a new synthetic DNA approach to vaccines. So what took six months before, we can now do in 24 hours or less. So NIH has funded our group to make synthetic pieces of every flu virus that's ever existed. Uh, and so any time uh, when we or others sequence uh, flu viruses, tracking them, we can just make a new vaccine candidate in less than a day. Uh, Novartis is scaling up with a new cell culture system uh, to very rapidly produce large amounts of this virus. We think we can design, using these synthetic approaches, viruses that have multivalent uh, components. So maybe there'll just be one flu vaccination, not a new one each year, uh, on top of pandemic ones. And if these techniques work, our goal is to apply them to other very rapidly evolving species, such as HIV, such as malaria, uh, et cetera. So it's an exciting phase, but we have to integrate all these areas. Uh, we have to look at the genetic code. Some people are more susceptible to diseases just based on your genetic code. Our metabiome changes that. Our immune system changes that. And we think writing the genetic code now and creating new species uh, will completely change us forever. Thank you.